Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning study, and we're going to open with a word of prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can come together again this morning and study the book of Daniel, chapter 11, and to seek light for our feet. We pray, Lord, for this movement and the people in it. We know, Lord, that um, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of voices clamoring for our attention, both within the movement and without the movement. And we just ask, Lord, that we can listen to your voice speaking to us, the voice that brings conviction, that shows us our need of you, and reveals your great love and mercy and grace uh, to work in our lives. We know, Lord, that um, there's many people that we love and care for that are struggling in various ways, and we just ask for your hand to be upon them. We pray for people in this movement and people like Jeff and others, Colin. We pray for them and their families and um, people like Stephen and Odilia. We pray that you can bless them. And others who have led out in the past and some who have rejected uh, the truths that have unfolded to this movement. Lord, we just uphold them all. We ask that um, your power can work in their lives. We pray for those searching for truth. We ask that your spirit can speak to their hearts. And uh, those watching these videos, that they can be drawn closer to you. Be with us now in this study. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. And um, so we're continuing Daniel chapter 11. And, and um, so we've had some struggles trying to understand uh, how to make applications of well, we struggled through parts of Daniel chapter 11. Some parts have fallen into place very well, others not so. And, you know, the reason that we're in this study is um, obviously Daniel chapter 11 is very important to this movement. And with the failure of, of July 18th, and then also uh the predictions, at least apparently, about our understanding of Donald Trump, um, him losing the election, not bringing in the Sunday law. We are uh, we were asked uh, by Colin to look at Daniel chapter 11 and in the light of that. And we have done that. And we've come to the conclusion uh, that the interpretation that, that Colin had is has great light in it. And it was leading us to a certain understanding, but not the understanding that, that he has. And we know that there is, um, you know, that Jeff, Elder Jeff has started writing again and uh, is making, uh, supposedly, I guess the prediction is that Donald Trump's going to become elected again, or not elected again, become president again in 2024 without an election. I don't know if that's true or not. That's the story that's going around, that that's what Jeff is saying. And we know that um, the only way that we can understand the truth is based on upon studying God's word. Now, and we also know that our understanding of God's word is partial. That is, we do not fully understand uh, things that God has not yet revealed to us, but also uh, we do not even fully understand the things that he has revealed to us that we're struggling to understand those things, to remember them, uh, to understand their significance. God gives us light for our feet. He doesn't have us see far off into the future in, in any kind of detail. We know the promises in his word that Christ is coming back. We know that a Sunday law is coming. We know that events are coming uh, that are going to wrap up this world's history. But the details that we need that he gives us are those for our feet presently. That is, we have to make decisions about um, 
our lives, what it is we believe, what it is we want to share, what it is we need to study. And we also need to make changes in our lives. There's things in our lives that have hindered God's working. And, um, you know, I experienced some of this yesterday, which uh, on Sabbath, I'll probably share a bit more detail. But one of the things I've learned that is, you know, I feel like I'm graduating kindergarten spiritually sometimes. Uh, Because some of the things that I learn are things that I've, I've told other people, but I never fully understood. And, um, and, 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 and uh, without going into too too much detail, because I want to share more on Sabbath. Um, but we pray for God to do things for us and God wants to, but he can't. And the reason he can't is if he did, we wouldn't learn the lessons that we need to learn about ourselves. And, and that's a really simple concept. But it, it's true of all of us. There are things we need to learn. There are things that God withholds from us, not because he doesn't want to bless us, but because if he did bless us now, we would never learn what we need to learn. And what we need to learn are things that are going to help us in the time ahead of us. And so keep that in mind, that if God isn't answering your prayers, it's not that he wants to withhold something from you. He actually wants to give you something more than that answer to your prayer, because that answer to your prayer is tied up with something else. And so as we struggle through this movement of what God has shown this movement, we can see just as on a personal level, We have this struggle. We also know that it exists within this movement itself. God is wanting to teach us something. And yet, if he was to to have history unfold the way that we think it should, we would not learn those things. If Nashville had been hit by a nuclear attack on July 18th, 2020, we would be not prepared for the things that are coming upon the world. We wouldn't have been prepared for that event, but be even less prepared for the things that are still coming. So um, we're going to look at this, at um, what we have been doing. And, you know, I've been doing some reading. So I want to go read some stuff from Swearingen's book. And it's just going to deal with this history that uh, we, we are studying, the raffia. And so I'm going to go to those notes here. Um, If I can find it. So this is going to deal with uh, verses 10 to 13 of Daniel chapter 11. So I'm going to switch screens I'm sharing. Make this a little bit bigger. Okay. So we know the verses, Daniel chapter 11, verse 10 to 13. Uh, But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. The one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. But then he shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So um, who are the sons that are stirred up? Who are the sons that are stirred up? The question I asked the other day is whether that was apostate Protestantism and Republicanism. And Republicanism, yes. Yeah, and I I think that, so that's Seleucus' sons, right? Uh, That's Seleucus III. Uh, and Antiochus III. And we're saying that they're representing republicanism and Protestantism in this church-state relation, right? Um, So we always have to keep in mind, you know, we're reading a historical application, and then we have to say, how does this relate to the present truth? 
Now, this, this really makes a lot of sense once we start thinking about it. Now, but we're going to still read this historical application. We'll come back to um, the present truth application. Okay. So he shall assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. Now, um, so when we see overflow and pass through, what we, we recognize that that's the Sunday law, right? Now, he's going to comment on the historical application. Because of the unprecedented victory of Ptolemy III in the Third Syrian War, the two sons of Seleucus were stirred up to avenge the humiliation of their father. The weak and short-tempered Seleucus III ascended to the throne, but ruled only for a short time after being poisoned by his military officers. He was succeeded by his 18-year-old brother, Antiochus III, Magnus, um, who reigned from 223 to July 18, 2020, um, 187 BC, who assembled a multitude of great forces to launch the Fourth Syrian War. He would overflow, meeting with initial success, recapturing much of the territory lost during the Third Syrian War, which would also include the prize of Col Syria, Koli Syria, Holo Syria, that's Palestine and, and, and Israel and, and that area, right, up to Syria. So that's, that's the territory um, that's being talked about there. Um, so he says, these victories by Antiochus were so decisive that the Egyptian naval presence in the Mediterranean had been neutralized and its army demoralized, thus leaving Egypt open to invasion. Yet despite the vulnerability of his rival, Antiochus III delayed to capitalize on this opportunity. This, cost, this costly hesitation on his part, coupled with the distraction of an internal rebellion in the east by a dis disloyal satrap in Babylon, would delay Antiochus's attention on Egypt long enough to give the successor of Ptolemy III, Ptolemy IV Philopater, the necessary time needed to regroup and assemble a powerful army. Later, by the time Antiochus III had returned from his eastern distraction in Babylon to resume his warfare against Egypt, Ptolemy IV had rebuilt a large enough military force to contend with his Seleucid rival and attempt to recapture Paulo Syria. Okay, so, so we know that that's the history. And if we take this history and we, we apply it um, uh, to our history, so I'm just going to go back. <clears throat> So we know that this is going to be um, this battle of Raphia is what we're going to be coming to, right? And so we're saying that in verse 10, uh, where it talks about um, this Sunday law, right? This overflowing and passing through. Can we see how that applies uh, to what has happened in this movement you know, in connection with, you know, July 18th and the pandemic and all that stuff, right? Can we see that there is, um, there are symbols there? Right. So, so we can see that that history is tied to our history. So this fourth Syrian war, um, we have some symbols in this that, that we need to consider. So are we going to take significance, uh, a C significance in the idea that uh, Antiochus III Magnus, um, he reigns till 187? Are we, is that just going to be a coincidence or are we going to take that as something and that we're going to have this battle of Raphia then in 2000 or 207, 217 BC, right? In this period of time. So, 
So how do we relate that to, because we're not putting this really directly in that pandemic, but we can see the pandemic is a type of this, of the Sunday law. And, and this, this uh, response of these, these sons, right? They're stirred up. Uh, he shall return and be stirred up even to his fortress. So the, the fortress here in this context is whose fortress? King of the North's fortress, isn't it? Um, well, so this is, um, so, so it says that Seleucus uh, II, the two sons of Seleucus II, so that's the, those are the kings of the North. We're saying they're Republicanism and Protestantism um, in the United States in their apostate forms. We're stirred up even to his fortress. So the way that we were looking at this, uh, um, that this fortress, uh, even to his, that would be Ptolemy the Fourth, Philopater's fortress, the UN's fortress. That is, that fortress would be these uh, group rights, right? The rights that they are are fighting against. So that there's this conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south over over rights. So if it's stirred up even to his fortress, the way that it's understood by Swearingen is that is the fortress of the king of the south. Right. So is that how we're going to understand it? So when it when and you look at your I Smith, um, so uh, how does he say it? He doesn't really address the his fortress phrase in in. Okay, uh, but if we're if we're reading this in context, yeah, taking this in the manner that that you're presenting it. Mm -hmm. We would include Daniel eleven nine. So that would be, so the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return into his own land. But his son, the king of the south, shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even to his fortress. I know. that. So that was the question I had. Should this be him just being re returning? Because there's two stirring ups here. A stirring up where he comes and overflows and passes through. And then he's stirred up, but even to his fortress. So the question is, whose fortress? Right? And if you take verse 9, and you can see that he returns to his own land. Well, this, this could be returning to his own fortress. The problem is we have this stirred up in there. And so that becomes something that we have to address. So the stirred up is uh, just means, the word means to grate. Um, and, and so it's used as a figurative way of talking about anger right so so he's going to contend the metal stir up strive so so he stirred up even to his fortress uh, this could not this could mean to the fortress of the king of the north to his own fortress right so what would that mean um if we're going to make an application to our time, because this would just be, he's simply returning to his own land, but he is stirred up. That is, he's, he's preparing for war, right? Even though he returns to his, his, his own land, right? Because 
He shall return into his own land, verse 9, dealing with the king of the south, to come into his kingdom. So to me, this would be a parallel, that we would have to say that this is the king of the north's fortress. And, and if he stirred up, he's stirred up to his fortress, if we're taking the fortress to be the American Constitution, that that's what he stirred up about. Would that make sense to people, that we would need to change our interpretation uh, that we have in our document? Because we were using Swearingen's interpretation. So if he stirred up even to his fortress, that wouldn't be Ptolemy the Philopaters. This would be the this would be um, Antiochus Antiochus the Thirds, right? So Antiochus the Third Magnus or Antiochus the Great. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So his fortress. So that's the USA. And then this fortress would have to be the American Constitution. Right? If we're going to do this interpretation. So we changed our interpretation of whose fortress. So this changes. He, Antiochus III, returns. So now he says fight against Egypt and be stirred up to his fortress. But this is after he has won the battle, right? That's after he's overflowed and passed through. Then he's going to return to his own land, which does happen. So we would just return. We're going to just say to Syria. And Syria is going to be the USA. Okay. Does that make sense? It's a good consideration. Now, the thing that we're, we're, we were struggling with with this verse in trying to place it into our time had to do the fact that we had Biden becoming elected. And then we have this Sunday law that's mentioned now, right? A type of a Sunday law, the overflowing and passing through. And this would definitely fit in with the idea that the Republican, the Republicans are going to win in this next election. And, and in the wind of this win of this next, next election, uh, we do have um, a type of victory that is, you know, from from the point almost like we have a Sunday law. And that's why we have start the fourth Syrian, Syrian war, this Sunday law. Well, you know, so one son, Antiochus III, if we put Trump in there and then we put the start of the fourth Syrian war, we'd have the Sunday law would take you rid of, get rid of the question mark. Um, so Antiochus III would be Trump, would return to the USA, be stirred up even to his fortress, the American's fortress, the American constitution. And this would be setting a stage for what's going to happen with Raffia. Now, whether that's Trump or some other Republican president, um, we would say that this is, this is a civil war in the United States and that this overflowing and passing through isn't going to be the actual Sunday law, but it is a type of the Sunday law. Now, one of the things about uh, what happened with the pandemic as a type of the Sunday law, right, with the restriction of, of individual rights, right, that's the, the whole issue um, in trying to see uh, what happened in that history, uh, how, why we think it's a Sunday law. It, it typifies what's going to happen in the future in regard to Sunday. But we know it's not a Sunday law. It's just a type of the Sunday law because the Sunday law is about Sunday. And if we're going to say that here we're saying Sunday law, in this case, well, this is not 
This is not about Sunday, but it is more religious. Right? That is, somebody's rights are going to be hindered it, when, when we have this response to what happened with the globalists taking over the United States. And we have this victory with apostate republicanism and apostate Protestantism, right? We're having both of these here. Um, that we have to expect something close to a Sunday law happening in the United States. And that would involve the Republicans conquering because we do believe that uh, raffia in type occurred with January 6th, 2021. And that a response to that has to occur prior to the actual raffia on this line. So we have to have a victory by the Republican Party in the United States. But this is but the United States. This isn't global in its proportions, which we think raffia and Paneum are. So we could say, you know, that Trump's going to become president again and that we're going to have a Sunday law of sorts. But it wouldn't be like the Sunday law that people are expecting. But this would be a backlash. Like what happened to individual rights that were trampled upon under the pandemic? Individual rights will again be trampled upon in the name of the Constitution, but this is not according to the Constitution. Is that possible? Because again, we're just we're just trying to work these things out. The way you're explaining it, I think it is possible. Yeah. So so I'm gonna put here that we're gonna have a Republican president. So that's the and and that president may be Trump. So I'm going to leave the question mark there. We don't know. But based on what we saw in um, uh, in our understanding of uh, the Persian kings, that Trump that this isn't about a resurrection of Trump. It's not about the eighth. This is actually the seventh, right? That would be logical. Okay. So it's it's not about the resurrection. So if Trump becomes president, if we're looking at the seven and the eight, we know the eighth is the beast that was and is not. Right? Even he is the eighth. And that can't be a president of the United States. So, so when we examined all of that, we said, okay, the seven kings are not the seven heads. The seven kings are presidents of the United States. That, that would be the application that we would make. Um, a primary application, not a secondary application. That that's just something that was never understood. And that's based upon understanding Revelation 13 is being the United States. And at the end of the United States, when it's going to uh, be prepared to unite in this threefold union, uh, that there's going to be seven presidents. And those seven presidents are going to begin at the time of the end, 1989, in this repeat of history. And so those seven kings are these seven presidents. And so, so we would say, you know, Trump being elected isn't him being the eighth, but Trump could become president. It could be some other Republican president. We don't know, but we're saying that's a possibility. Now, it could also just be a Trump not being elected, but just in this battle that's going on within the United States within a civil war. And that, so it doesn't have to even become the president of the United States to be involved in this battle, this stirring up even to the, to the American Constitution. 
So we could say that this, this applies to our history already in, in what has happened. So, so there's different ways in which we could understand this. Um, and so this could be part of the propaganda campaign against wokeism still. That's going to be won without Trump becoming president. But it's going to set up the stage for what's going to happen. And what's going to happen based upon this battle of Raffia is that atheistic communism will, will move with anger against um, uh, the world. It's going to be moved with choler. That is, it's going to raise a large army. The governments of the world are going to come and prepare for war, right? This is atheistic communism. And this is the suggestion, right? We're not saying that this is the final answer to how we understand this. But whatever this battle of Raffia is, it's more about an ideology than it is a country. It's not Russia. You know, it's not even, you know, it's not even the UN itself as an entity. It's a propaganda campaign campaign that goes worldwide that that is a movement, and that movement has been growing. And even though we have this temporary pushback in the United States, on a worldwide wide scale, that propaganda campaign of atheistic communism will succeed. And we're saying that what is suggested by the World Economic Forum, I'm not saying that they're, they're going to accomplish it, those, but those ideas of this sort of neo-Marxism or neo-communism, whatever you want to call it, are going to be practiced in some way. But the world is going to try this. A, a controlled economy using the technology that we have today. And the idea in, in the conspiracy theories is that, well, you know, we have all of this technology and we can manipulate um, the populace so that we can control the economy. We can control what people want, right? We have, we have the feedback now that allows us to, to run in this command economy, right? Because that was one of the problems, one of the criticisms of communism of, is that because if you take away the market, the market actually works on the allocation of goods. Right by by changing the prices of things, so so decisions are made not by one mind, but by a collective mind of individuals all throughout the world making their daily decisions on what, what they want to do, what they want to buy, how they want to spend their time. That's that's basically that type of understanding of the economy has to do with Austrian economics. It's called praxeology, right? So that. So that the economy is something that works without the intervention of, of any government. It just works because people want things. And so they're going to decide to pay the price for something or not. And all of those decisions, like nobody could know what those decisions are. We don't have enough knowledge. But with technology, with AI, the idea is we could have a computer that can, can read those things, but also manipulate the population so that we can have them buy what they want to buy and do what we want them to do without them feeling that they were forced to do it, right? But we can manipulate them through pleasure, through, through propaganda and so forth to act in certain ways. And so 20, 30, you could have it that you don't own anything and you're happy about it, right? Of course, you know, it's very unrealistic, I think, even with AI. But but that's that's sort of the conspiracy that that, that that would happen. But it is the idea that people think that that is a good idea and that they might push for something in this way, which would completely and absolutely fail because people would have their freedoms taken away from them. People wouldn't have the things they want. And that society wouldn't be able to provide the things that people want. So, so that would be the Battle of Raffia. Right? Initially, they would win. 
They would get their chance to push this agenda and it would be accepted by the population. But then the pushback comes and the pushback is going to be going from one ditch into another, right? That's the idea that I'm suggesting here. Does that seem reasonable based upon what we see in these verses about Rafi and Panin? Or do we have to go back to an idea that this is more about, you know, Russia and the U.S.? Or something else that we've never considered? Any thoughts? So the idea that the Battle of Raffia can be the Great Reset set in place, just, just as a catchphrase. <clears throat> Does that make any sense? Well, they're looking at this great reset coming up in 2025, right? 2030. Hmm. That's that's where the great reset it has been set for, right? That's that's the whole idea. That by 2030 they're going to have this you know, set in place. Now, of course, they, they, they always keep moving the goalposts. I mean, they've been doing this for, you know, since the 70s, I guess. Um, setting an agenda of what, what's going to, you know, it's sort of like somebody's five-year plan of what they're going to do with their life. Uh, but none of it ever happens. Because you know, it's too unrealistic. You know, if my, my five-year plan was to become president of the United States. Um, you know, can never happen, I'm not American, but, you know, people have sometimes unrealistic uh, five-year plans. And I would think that the World Economic Forum has had very unrealistic five-year plans or seven-year plans or whatever years they're going to figure out. But in, in this case, it seems much more likely that some of these ideas are going to be accepted and attempt to be implemented. Uh, we do see that in Canada. But the one thing that we see is it really does destroy economies. These ideas are not going to succeed um, by any stretch, no matter how much technology you have uh, to try to bring them into place. But, but the real question is, you know, we see this now as an ideology that's going to be forced upon the world rather than a country battling against another country. Any more thoughts on this, right? Is is this making sense or not? Like maybe we could have a vote, you know. I don't know. But because this is a different stance. When it came to the Battle of Raffia before, we were looking at the United States and Russia. Then we were looking at Republicans and Democrats. And and definitely that applies in our history. But that's not the actual battle of Rafi and Panin. So we can see that verse 10 is this, this situation that has occurred within the U.S. that is occurring 
within the US and is setting up a situation that's gonna happen on a global scale. But that battle is going to be fought. And in this case, the King of the North is apostate Republicanism and Protestantism, right? It's, it's the United States in a sense, but not the United States necessarily as a government, but as these, these two principles, which now have been distorted, fighting against the world, the ideas of the world. So if you get the United States either in a, in a place where we have a Republican president like Trump fighting against these ideologies, I mean, you could say in a sense the United States is there. So the United States still in a sense is the king of the north. Now, another problem that we have is, is the papacy. Now, we're going to see that the papacy comes in here. Like once we get through this uh, battle of Paneum. Rome comes back into the picture. And, and we have to decide how we, we deal with that when Rome initially comes in, um, because then we're going to have, you know, pagan Rome, and we're going to repeat this history. Pagan Rome is going to typify um, our history again. So, any thoughts on this? This is a lot of stuff to think about. But let's just take the one point. Can we accept that the Battle of Raphia is going to be atheistic communism having a defeat on a global scale over, you know, we'll say, you know, uh, American cross Protestant capitalism? And what would that actually mean? If communism was to have the ability to defeat republicanism, the American values, then this would be a repudiation of everything that, that the American Constitution has stood for. Right. Now, we're not saying that it, it happens in America in this case. We're talking about on a global scale. Well, I, in America, it would be a civil war over these issues, right? We're already in many ways in a civil war over these issues. Right, so, so we know we are, but we're gonna say that, that somewhere on a global scale, these principles are going to be put into place. And maybe partially in the U.S., maybe not, I don't know. But um, definitely a civil war is occurring in the United States over these issues. And we have all these young people who have been educated in such a way that they do not understand the principles of what actually ha helps a society to be stable, Right. So much so that they actually think that if they just tear down the institutions of the United States, that we will we will move into a utopia because they believe that we're naturally good, that the all, all of the problems are caused by um, governments interfering, and there's a partial truth to it but governments interfering with our happiness, that things naturally go good and governments make things go bad. And so if we, they just left us to ourselves, a type of anarchy, um, 
then you know everybody would be happy. Everybody would have everything they needed. You know, it's these, and and you can see the the whole irony of of all of this, because who's really behind pushing this is these these multinational national corporations, the tech community, and the media, and all of these educational institutions pushing these ideologies that would completely undermine the whole foundation of society, right? You know, even with Obama, his, his, his campaign was based upon uh, change or something, hope and change. I can't remember exactly what the phrase was. Hope and change was his. Okay, hope and change? I believe that Which, was correct. Yeah, which is which is a pretty like change. Well, what do you mean by change? Like, if you're talking about just changing everything, what what changes? What needs to be changed? And and just hope, you know, like if we change everything, we just hope everything's going to work out. I mean, I mean, they're pretty meaningless phrases. I mean, of course, it's politics, right? Um, this sort of the idea that somehow we need change. Well, there's a reason why things are the way they are, why institutions exist and why they operate in the way that they do, because no person really knows why anything is the way it is. Right? We don't know why we need these institutions and why we have all of these laws. They're just something that developed over time because it works. And so if you just remove these institutions, you definitely are doing an experiment to see what would happen. Like if you got rid of the police forces, you know, if you got rid of police, um, what ends up happening? Right? You may say, well, we have problems with how police act and we have problems with prisons and things are unfair and there's all this uh, um uh, things are unjust. And so, so we're just going to get rid of these institutions and that's going to bring about justice and fairness. But there are many people who believe that. So, so I don't really have, even understand this, this philosophy, this wokeism, this atheistic communism, because it's, it's not intellectually cohesive. It's not logical or rational. It's just, it's, it's an emotional philosophy. And yet it's very, very popular. You know, I've have had conversations with people who are communist, young people, and, and they just have no idea what they're talking about. They have no idea of reality. And of course, I'm just a, a boomer, right? So I don't know anything. So, so this is the world that, that we have. So, so, so we can say that this has already happened, but the Battle of Raffia would have to be something on a global scale where the countries of the world agree on some kind of new economic structure and institutional structure that is, we would have to say, is atheist to communist. Definitely, it would go against the American Constitution. And if America adopted it, uh, there would be definitely a civil war in the United States over this. We already have it, but I'm talking about like a, an actual civil war. <clears throat> and then the backlash to that on a worldwide scale would be that the ideas of the American Constitution but through this um, lens of apostate Protestantism would be worse than what was happening under atheistic communism. And especially if you see society falling apart, if you see economic structures. Because right now, we've talked about this before, the American military provides the security for the global economy. 
without the American military policing the oceans, we would not be able to have the trade that we do today, correct? Agreed. And it's the it's America doing it. It's not all these other countries doing it. America is providing this global economy. And I've read lots of articles about this and papers, understanding the fear that people have. Now, if you remove the American military power from doing that, from policing the oceans, you would have massive starvation throughout the world. And, and so the idea is that, you know, if you have this atheistic communism, whatever you want to call it, take over the economic systems of the world, it's destructive, right? We saw it in other countries. And it doesn't matter if you have AI trying to control this. It's probably even worse if you have AI trying to control it. Because... AI is something to be feared. If it has control or making decisions, those decisions would be the decisions based upon not what's best for the individual, but what, but what is best in quotation marks for the majority, for the survival of the human race, whatever that means. Right. So there are people who really fear AI because of its power uh, to control. So if you have it providing the information, even if ultimately that it doesn't make the decisions, um, it's not it's not the free market anymore. And it hasn't really been truly the free market for a long time, but at least the free market does exist in the sort of what we call the underground economy. Um, so. So if we see society fall apart, we can easily see how this apostate Protestantism and apostate Republicanism would come in and fill the void, right? So this is the thing that we struggled with as Seventh-day Adventists, at least I have, for a long time. How does this happen? And this, we can see that it's being set up for what has to happen in order for there to be um, a universal Sunday law. Okay, so, and that universal Sunday law, well, we're gonna see that the Battle of Paneum is not the universal Sunday law itself, but it definitely sets up for the defeat of the enemy or the submission of the enemy, which we would call in the, in the threefold union is spiritualism. So that spiritualism, in order to exist in its sort of... Um, uh, basic form it still has to survive because it has to be part of that threefold union right and so that that universal sunday law that is in the result of a threefold union right the dragon the beast and the false prophet right so so however that occurs, it, it can't be the destruction of this ideology itself, just the destruction of its ability to control the world in the way that it wanted to. So everybody's getting their chance, in a sense, to run the world. But the, ultimately, what they do is they unite. They unite their forces. And we know that it's the USA that reaches its hand across the, the Gulf to join the hands with the, the papal power and its other hand across the abyss to join with uh, spiritualism, with the dragon power, right? And in that threefold union that we see these events, these final events occur, the universal Sunday law, ultimately the close of probation, the seven last plagues are going to fall out. Um, 
we're going to fall. And then we're going to have the time of Jacob's trouble and then the resurrection of, uh, you know, the special resurrection, right? The second coming of Christ and then, um, you know, the destruction of the wicked, and then the thousand years, Satan bound for a thousand years. All those events, right? Those things happening. So the question is, if we if we believe that this is this global sort of conflict, we would have to say that this has this is beginning to happen, right? The battle of we're in a sense in the battle of Raphia to some degree, but it's not come to the battle. We're we're in the fourth Syrian war, maybe, but you know the battle of Raphia is still future. Midnight is still future. So are, are we forcing an interpretation upon this text? You know, and, and I ask that question to people here and also to people watching uh, the videos. And, and I'm always thankful for the comments that people make, uh, especially the ones that challenge what we're saying. Because they need to be challenged, right? I mean, we need to, to have uh, our ideas challenged, and we've changed a lot of ideas as we've gone through. And partly it is because of the challenges that people have given. Now, I think as time goes on, we will see and understand these more clearly, uh, especially as we get through uh, this next election. Okay, so then we have um, the Battle of Raphia, and then we have the Battle of Panean, right? So we had we had started looking at the Battle of Panean here. Um, for the King of the North and Tychus, so we have USA there, shall return and set forth a multitude greater than the former. So the start of the Fifth Syrian War. Now, um, so when we look at these battles, um, I'm just going to, so this fifth Syrian war is, is actually, um, it's at the beginning of this war that you have the battle of Panin, right? So it's, um, you're going to have in 204, 5, 204, the Seleucid king Antiochus the third. Uh, knowing that a dyna dynastic crisis is approaching in the Ptolemaic Empire, agreed to divide his possessions outside Africa, revolt to Hor Winefer in Egypt. In July of August of 2004, the death of Ptolemy IV, Queen Mother Arsinoe III is assassinated. And in 202, the royal advisors Agath Ocles and Sosebius are replaced by Telopolemus and later Aristomenes. So there's going to be the outbreak in May of 202 BC of the Fifth Syrian War. So that's going to be a um, uh, sea battle in the Aegean Sea. And then in 2201, Rome is alarmed in advance that Philip halts his aggression. So Rome is going to uh, be involved in this a little bit. And then in 200, Antiochus occupies hollow Syria, and you have the Battle of Panium. Rome declares war against Macedonia, which leaves the war against the Ptolemies, and, um, and orders both to keep their hands off Egypt, which is vital for Rome's food supply. So Antiochus in 199, 197, Antiochus counsels his invasion of Egypt and instead tacks Ptolemic possessions in Cilicia. Right. So you have this this battle of Panium as part of the fifth Syrian war. So 
So the battle of, so, um, so we have the start of this fifth Syrian war and how would we characterize this then based on what we've read in our history? So what would we call the fifth Syrian war? I mean, it's not, it's not going to be the battle of Peniel, right? So there's this regrouping that happens from 212 to 204, right? And then we're going to have, so this fifth Syrian war, what is it characterizing? It's a response to Um, atheistic communism. Okay, so we have this response to atheistic communism. So this regrouping, right? So this is something that's going to happen. We're saying it hasn't happened yet. There's going to be a regrouping. And then you have the Battle of Panin, right? So this, um, and we're just going to say this is the midnight crime. Just put it there. And, you know, if we look back with the Battle of Raffia, like so we we haven't really put it in here. Um, so we have the Battle of Raffia. We're saying the Great Reset set into place. So we would have to say this would also equal the equal midnight. Right. So we have midnight there. That's the Battle of Raffia. So any thoughts on this? This type of concept is just going to take some time to really consider. Okay. Now, we know that what, what we read there that was on Livius.org. Um, so we know that Rome comes in. So Rome is going to be concerned about what's happening with between, uh, well, with, with uh, Egypt. So why is Rome alarmed in 201 and demands that Philip halts his aggression? What is the what is the issue? What is Rome concerned about? What is the papacy concerned about? Well, historically, Rome was concerned about the Seleucid Empire having too great of an influence in this part of the world. Right, because... Rome doesn't, Rome wants to, it, it has its interests, right? So Rome at that point, by this point, was beginning its territorial incursions. And we see them coming to, you know, coming to more of a head, coming to a victory in 191 BC. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so we got about nine years after the Battle of Panean that we have right. those events. Now, so when we look at this, um, th these next ver verse 14, um, I don't know if I agree with the like the attempt to eliminate Judaism 
complete elimination of God's people. Um, I don't think that that's what what they're doing here, though it though it is an undercurrent of it. I don't think it's the main purpose because this is more about self preservation. So if we see if we see that there's battle of Rafi in the battle of Neve, we see these these forces: the dragon power and apostate Protestantism. Watching from the sidelines is the papacy, is Rome, right? Right. And is has been playing the long game, right? The long con, or however long that would be, you know, at least since, you know, uh, the first millennium AD, somewhere in there. They, they, they've had this pl- these plans to to bring uh, Catholicism to the whole world, right? And and of course they don't have the gospel to do so. They use the power of the state to bring about their ends. And but they don't want to see this dragon power eliminated completely, right? They don't want to see Egypt destroyed. Now, why is that? We can say, well, from the point of, of Rome, it doesn't want the one to become more powerful. And that could be the case with the papacy here. Does the papacy see Protestantism as a threat to its goals? Is the United States a threat to the goals of the papacy? As a Protestant Republican nation, yes. Yeah, and it will see that even if it's apostate Protestantism, it would still see to some degree, um, if it if it that that the papacy is not needed for Protestantism to exist. Now, sure, there's been compromises made with the papacy, but Protestantism still, in an essence, is opposed to. It's a protest against Rome. And so Rome would fear that. That if, you know, part of the thing that with the the Cold War is, you know, the papacy wanted to see the the defeat of, of the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was a threat. But it also sees the United States as a threat. So it made an alliance with the U.S. But it's also made alliances with the dragon power as well, right? The papacy, the end justifies the means. So we can see then, as we look at the beginning here of, because the question is, where's the Sunday law? Well, what you're gonna have with Greece is it's gonna bring you to the battle of Paneum to the midnight cry, but it doesn't bring you to the Sunday law. But verse 14, we have uh, we have at least the beginning of that, right? So these lines are not necessarily complete because now once we get to verse 14 and onward, well, we're going to start to move to pagan Rome, right? So you know, I, I would take up to verse 15 that this would be this this part here. We're going to have to somehow see how this typifies the Sunday law. Right. And, and we're going to get to Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, this this comes upon sensitive ground. Right. That is, we know that Antiochus Epiphanes is not. Um, the. Uh, the abomination of desolation, right? Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation is spoken by Daniel the prophet, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, the history of the siege and so forth, um, with the destruction in 70 AD, right?
But we know that many people look at what happened with the Tychus Epiphanies as sort of a fulfillment of that prophecy. Now, there was suggestions, and so this is sensitive ground because we have Desmond Ford. What did Desmond Ford do with the Tychus Epiphanies? What was the, the principle that he in introduced? Does anybody know? You may not know this history. Why did Desmond Ford, what did he do with Antiochus Epiphanes? So he tried to make the fourth kingdom, not, not Rome, but... And, and the little horn to be a Tychus Epiphanes, right? I believe that's correct. Okay. So, so we had this, um, and so he said, well, that was a fulfillment of prophecy and, and it sort of typifies something. So he, he tried to make like a dual application of it. We saw Parminder do the same thing. So Parminder said, no, it actually, you know, the little horn power and all these things, they actually apply to the Tychus Epiphanies, but we make a secondary application in order to have them apply to the papacy, right? So he's going to have this history uh, be what the book of Daniel is about. It's going to be, it's, now that idea is based upon a premise that the book of Daniel is actually written in the second century BC in response to Atticus Epiphanes, and that all Daniel's prophecies are really just leading up to that event, right? That's the, that's the idea, okay? There's a lot more to it. Um, Okay, so I'm just going to read something here about what Desmond Ford taught. Um, so Desmond, uh, Dr. Ford has interpreted by means of the apotelismatic principle, apotelismatic principle uh, of Daniel 2, 7, 8, 9, and 11. He could do it only by, de by denying the year-day principle and the historicist method of interpretation. However, though Israel was not faithful, the main idea of Daniel's prophecies would yet be fulfilled in principle in later events. Thus, the little horn foot, for example, would be fulfilled by Atticus Epiphanes in pagan Rome, in papal Rome, and in Satan's manifestation just, in be just before after, and after the millennium. So he's going to have Antiochus Epiphanes, the little horn, be fulfilled in pagan Rome. And in papal Rome, and in Satan's manifestation, just before and after the millennium. Each of these entities would experience judgment and be destroyed with none to help them, thus fulfilling in principle the intents of Daniel's prophecies. These successive judgments were predicted by uh, then shall the sanctuary be justified. Every era, era of revival of the truth symbolized in the sanctuary may claim to be a fulfillment of Daniel 8.14. Uh, and this, so this is uh, Ministry Magazine. And so the writer says, although we recognize the possibility of more than one fulfillment when the context requires it or when a later inspired writer makes the application, we must reject Ford's usage of the apotelismatic principle, apotelismatic principle, because it lacks external control. Any principle of interpretation that permits any prophecy to mean many things is not a helpful tool. Okay, so when, we, when we're doing this, we need to understand what it is we're doing and what distinguishes what we're doing from what Desmond Ford was doing. So can we see Antiochus Epiphanes in the book of Daniel chapter 11?
not in the way that Ford approached it. Right, not in the way, but but he does exist, right? I mean, we've just seen all of these these kings of Greece and or you know the divisions of Greece, both in the Ptolemaic kings and the Syri- uh, uh, the Syrian kings. We've seen them that they're part of history, and so Atticus Epiphanes can occur in that history. Now, when he puts here the robbers of thy people, the Seleucid Syrian invaders under Antiochus IV Epiphanes, shall exalt themselves, attempt to eliminate Judaism. You can see in this is Swearingen's view. He's actually putting Antiochus Epiphanes here in the place of the papacy. We would say the robbers of thy people is the papacy, right? Rome. Or, you know, Rome first. But well, pagan and pagan. Exactly, Rome. Okay, but he's putting it here as a Tychus Epiphanes, right? So you can see he, he's placing it here. And then we have to say, well, is a Tychus Epiphanes then typifying Rome, or should this be Rome themselves as the application? So when we look at this, um, verse 14, so let's go up to... Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. Right. So you can see the, the problem that we're having when we use uh, Swearingen. He's going to have some things that we have to consider. So in those times, there shall be many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Antiochus Magnus, that's Antiochus um, Third was not the only one who rose up against the infant Ptolemy. Uh, Agathocles, his prime minister, having possession of the king's person and conducting the affairs of the kingdom in his stead, was so dissolute and proud in the exercise of his power that the provinces which were before subject to Egypt rebelled. Egypt itself was dis- disturbed by seditions and the Alexandrians rising up against Agathoc- Agathocles caused him, his sister, and his mother, and their associates to be put to death. At the same time, Philip of Macedon entered into a league with Antiochus to divide the dominions of Ptolemy between them, each proposing to take the parts which lay nearest and most convenient to. Here was a rising up against the king of the south sufficient to fulfill the prophecy, and it resulted beyond doubt in the exact events which the prophecy forecast. A new power is introduced, the robbers of thy people, literally um, says Thomas Newton, the sons of the breakers of thy people. Far away on the banks of the Tiber, kingdom has been nourishing ambitious projects and dark designs, small and weak at first, it grew in strength and vigor with marvelous rapidity, reaching out cautiously here and there to try its prowess and test its warlike arm until with consciousness of its power, it boldly reared its head among the nations of the earth and seized with an invincible hand the helms of affairs. Henceforth, the name of Rome stands upon the page of history, destined for long ages to control the world and to exert a might, uh, a mighty influence among the nations, even to the end of time. Rome spoke, and Syria and Macedon soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered in behalf of the young king of Egypt, determined that there should be that he should be protected from the ruin devised by Antiochus and Philip. This was 200 BC, and one of the first important inferences of the Romans in the affairs of Syria and Egypt. Rollin furnishes the following succinct account of this matter: Antiochus, king of Syria, and Philip, king of Macedon, during the reign of Ptolemy Philopater had discovered the strongest zeal for the interest of that monarch and were ready to assist him on all occasions. Yet no sooner was he dead, leaving behind him an infant, whom the laws of humanity and justice enjoined them not to disturb in the possession of his father's kingdom, than they immediately join in a criminal alliance and excite each other to take off the lawful heir and divide his dominions between them. Philip was to have Caria, Livia, Cyrenaica, and Egypt, and Antiochus all the rest. With this view, the latter entered Col Syria and Palestine, and in less than two campaigns, made an entire conquest of these two provinces, with all their cities and dependencies. 
Their guilt, says Polybius, would not have been quite so glaring had they, like tyrants, endeavored to gloss over their crimes with some specious pretense. But so far from doing this, their injustice and cruelty were so barefaced that to them was applied what is generally said of fishes, that the large ones, though of the same species, prey on the lesser. One would be tempted, continued the same author, at seeing the most sacred laws of society so openly violated to accuse providence of being indifferent and insensible to the most horrible crimes, but it fully justified its conduct by punishing those two kings according to the, their deserts and made such an example of them as ought in all succeeding ages to deter others from following their example. For whilst uh, they are meditating to dispossess a weak and helpless infant of his kingdom by piecemeal, providence raised up the Romans against them who entirely subverted the kingdoms of Philip and Antiochus and reduced their successors to almost as great calamities as those with which they intended to crush the infant king. And then he says, to establish the vision, the Romans are more than any other people are the subject of Daniel's prophecy. Their first interference in the affairs of these kingdoms is here referred to as being the establishment or demonstration of the truth of the vision which predicted the existence of such a power, but they shall fall, is referred by some to those mentioned in the first part of the verse, who should stand up against the king of the south, others to the robbers of Daniel's people, the Romans. It is true in either case. If those who combined against Ptolemy are referred to, all that need to be said is that they did speedily fall. If it applies to the Romans, the prophecy simply pointed to the period of their final overthrow. So, so we're going to have to say that this is Rome coming in. Um, and that we could not apply the robbers of thy people to the Seleucid Syrian invaders under Antiochus IV, if we accept um, this. Now, if you think about what we just read about this history, um, if we're going to say the robbers of thy people is Antiochus IV, um, what, what's the problem? What's the main problem? Because we've seen other other kings, other uh, Syrian kings here. So why would we say this can't be Antiochus the Fourth? Because his his interpretation, Swearingen's, is he saying, well, this is just where you're going to see, and and they're both talking about the same history. If you read your I Smith, if you read Swearingen, they're talking about this history though. Uriah Smith is putting it um, at the point where uh, they're dividing up uh, this kingdom, right? So if you go here, I just want to point this out with, uh, here we go, to this chart. So you're going to have Atticus the fourth here. So you have um, Seleucus the fourth, right? And Ptolemy the sixth. So where are we supposed to go? We're going to go back here. So Antiochus the fourth, he's way up in this history, right? But Rome comes in this history saying, take your hands off of Egypt. So that's going to be under Antiochus Magus, right? The great, Antiochus the third. Where Swearingen's going to move it over to this history. Right. So. So we would w want to have it in this history, correct? We would say that this is is correct, that it's not talking about Antiochus the fourth. It's talking about Antiochus the third. Does that make sense to people? So the fifth Syrian war, that's going to begin. Um, in that history of the Battle of um, Paneum, right? So we have the Battle of Paneum. And right after that, you're going to have this dividing up of the Ptolemaic Empire. And who's involved in dividing up that empire? That's going to be 
Antiochus, the king of Syria, and Philip, the king of Macedon. Or Macedonia, right? Agreed. Okay. And I would think that that fits. So, so the robbers of thy people are not going to be Syria or Antiochus. These, these are going to be, they're going to exalt themselves to establish the, the vision. So many shall stand up against the king of the south. So this is at least Antiochus, the king of Syria, and Philip, the king of Macedon. So, so we have to uh, change this paper. So, uh, Philip, king of and Then we have to figure out what that is in our history. But we're just going to say that that's what history this is describing. It's not describing history under Antiochus. Um, that should be. So this is going to be Ptolemy. Uh, we'll just put it here. And, uh, So it's Ptolemy, what, the fourth Philippator? Yeah, I'll just do it this way. That's right, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is going to be the robbers of the people are Rome. Now they're exalting themselves to establish the vision. So, um, so what is it that they're doing? Just get rid of that. Maybe, maybe I'll put that back, but I'll just change it. When we've looked at that before in establishing the vision, we've always had that as Hebrew 2377. Um, yeah, the word establish. No, I'm talking the word the vision. Oh, vision. oh the word vision. Okay. Okay, which, which number? Hebrew 2377, isn't it? Okay, yes. So that's going to be the chazon. Right. So we're so, talking we're, we're talking about this vision that establishes both paganism and papalism. Power. That yeah. Agreed. Okay. And that, that is, of course, the historic interpretation. Right? I would I would say it's historic, yes, but I mean we're also dealing with you know what we have we've come to expect. Yeah. But I was saying that we're gonna place this in our history too, right? So right now we're just looking at at the the direct application of, of the prophecy of Daniel 11. Okay. Um, so, so they shall fall. The question is, who is the day, the they? And, and your eyes misses, well, there's two different interpretations, right? 
Um, but one is that these ones that uh, uh, come in, so Philip, King of Macedon, and Titus the uh, Third, that they're going to fall. So I, I would say that that still would apply. It's not so much that Rome's going to fall. I mean, you could say, well, Rome's going to fall, but I think you're not going to be brought to that end here. They come to establish the vision, but they shall fall. And it could be true of Rome. Rome is going to fall. But Rome really continues until the end. So it's kind of, you know, when we're looking at it as the two desolating powers, pagan and papal Rome, um, I mean, we could say pa papal Rome falls in 1798. So it falls. But the thing is, they come to establish the vision. And the one that falls, the one that's going to fall, is, is Greece. It's going to fall to, to Rome with its collapse. Rome's going to come in. Now, now we put in there um, 191. Now, could we put there uh, 191? So maybe that's a question we can answer tomorrow. How we're going to look at this, where this fall occurs. Okay. So I thank everyone for joining in this study. It's been a difficult study in some ways, right? But are we making sense out of it? Okay, I think we are, but there's still more to understand. So we're going to uh, address this further tomorrow. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the time that we've had here this morning. Once again, Lord, we ask that um, you can be in our lives and that we can obey your voice. Forgive us for our sins and our lack of trust in you. Help us, Lord, to let go of those things that hinder our walk with you. And may you continue to bless us. Be with each person today. May your angels watch over them. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>